Hey everyone, I'm starting a brand new series and this is the first video in that series. I'm going to be walking you through how to transition successfully from the world of Power BI to the world of Microsoft Fabric. I know from speaking to a lot of you out there, a lot of you are Power BI developers and a lot of you have seen the kind of the innovation and the new tools available to you in Fabric now. And you want to know what are the best strategies and what do we need to consider to make that migration really successful. When I talk about that migration, this is really what I'm talking about, right? So you're probably familiar, you're probably working towards what I would call a, a Power BI centric architecture currently. So you've got some data sources and each of these data sources might be either going into a data flow, so a Power BI traditional data flow, or you might just be loading it straight into your Power Query engine in Power BI Desktop. And this is what I would call a Power BI centric architecture. And what we can move to now to start leveraging all of that good stuff that Fabric provides us is what we call a Fabric centric architecture, right? So instead of ingesting our data straight into Power Query in our Power BI data model, instead now we're going to be ingesting into Fabric and we're going to be storing that data in one of the data stores available to us in Fabric. So either a lake house or a data warehouse or a KQL database. And then we can read that data into our Power BI reports from Fabric. So this is what we call the Fabric centric architecture. And it looks like quite a simple change, right? But actually there's so many things that we need to consider of how we set up Fabric and there's lots of different strategies. So depending on your requirements here, you might've got quite stuck, right? There's so much choice and a lot of these concepts might be new to you. So in this video and in this series, I'm going to be filming seven or eight different videos that walk through some of the key decision points that I think you're going to face in the future when you're migrating from this Power BI centric architecture to a fabric architecture. And I know these are important because I asked you in my community. So if you haven't joined our community yet on school, then I would definitely recommend that you do that. And I asked people in our community, you know, what's the biggest unknown in Fabric? What are you kind of currently struggling with? What would you like to know more about? And we've had a really good discussion. Lots of people are getting stuck in, but there's a lot of recurring themes. And these recurring themes are exactly what I want to produce videos on in this series. So some of the themes that I've noticed is about, this one's about getting data from AWS, so how do we get data into Fabric is a common theme. How do we choose the right data store? So is it a lake house? Is it a warehouse? What are the differences here? What are the nuances between the different data stores? When do we choose which one depending on our requirements? There's also Kojo here has asked about the medallion architecture. So this is a lake house architecture that a lot of people are applying in Fabric. So we'll talk about the benefits of that the drawbacks of that, when to use it, when not to use it, and things to consider there. Also got a question around fabric shortcuts. So when do we choose whether we ingest data or create a shortcut to an external data source? So perhaps you've got data already in Azure Data Lake storage or even in Amazon S3 buckets. So these are the kind of things that lots of people are asking me about in, in our community. Another thing that we talk about or has been asked about is workspace organization, right? And it's linked to the medallion architecture or whichever architecture you choose because workspaces are so important, more important than they are in Power BI, I would argue, because in Power BI, it's just kind of organizing where your data sets or your semantic models and your reports live. In Fabric, they have some constraints around because we're kind of moving data between different workspaces sometimes or creating shortcuts between these things. There are constraints around how people can access different data sets. So depending on your kind of access control requirements is going to inform your workspace strategy. So I get lots of questions about workspaces as well. Here again, we're talking about data factory and lake house and choosing the right thing. So just to flick back to this, this diagram here, and in case you're not 100% sold on the idea that this is actually a better way of working for most people, not for everyone, but for most people, why do we think this is a good idea, the fabric centric approach? Well, number one, I would say data governance becomes a lot more simple. And here I'm talking about access to data, documenting your data, all of these things comes with fabric. Um, and it's very difficult to do 
that kind of thing in a kind of Power BI world. Also enables or makes self-service analytics a lot simpler to implement, I would argue. Now, one of the biggest benefits that I see in this kind of fabric centric architecture is around data quality, right? Because in our traditional system, our data sources are being ingested directly into a data flow or a Power BI. And this is really flimsy, right? This is very prone to error because anyone that's worked in data analytics and Power BI for a while, you'll know that data sources change, the data structure change, data types change. The quality of the data that comes from these different sources generally changes over time. And there's no protection against those changes in this Power BI centric architecture, right? Or at least you can't, it's very difficult to add in kind of data quality checks and data validation checks. And what does that lead to? Well, it leads to your users seeing erroneous data, errors, things, or your Power BI model fails to refresh, if there's errors kind of in the structure of the data that changes, all these things make users lose trust in your reporting and your dashboards. So in Fabric, one of the key benefits that I see anyway is we can really get a grip on building a robust system for managing data quality. And the final one that I'd mentioned here is around data science, AI and ML machine learning. So Fabric is marketed as the data platform for the era of AI. And if you're still using your traditional architecture for Power BI, it's very difficult really to integrate machine learning, AI, data science stuff on top of that Power BI centric architecture. So when we move to Fabric, the Fabric centric architecture, the whole reason Fabric has been built to make your data sets in your organization a lot more accessible for things like training machine learning models, letting your data scientists analyze your data kind of a lot more easily. And there's the oncoming kind of LLM, large language model revolution, I would say, co-pilot integration. All of these things are basically making it as easy as possible to expose your data to large language models, generative models that are gonna basically try and drive more business value for your business. So there's some of the three good reasons, but how? How do we do this bit in the middle? And obviously there's no right or wrong answer here. There's just lots of strategies and considerations. So here's what's coming up in the next seven or eight videos. There might be a few more, but I plan for about seven or eight at the moment of some of the things that I think are the most important things to get right when we're transitioning from Power BI into Fabric. So the first one I wanna mention is around how do we organize our workspaces, right? So this is probably one of the first things you're gonna think about if you've just set up a new Fabric tenant and you're kind of responsible for your organizational strategy in this. What are some of the strategies that we can implement for workspaces to make sure that everyone has access to the items that they need and they're structured in a good way? And these can be controlled at different granularities, right? So we can give access to people at the workspace level, at the item level, so by item level, I mean like at the data warehouse level. So giving someone access to the data warehouse and also at the object objects level. And by that, I mean, for example, a table in a data warehouse and at the row level. So we can do all of these different things. And we'll talk about how to combine these different things depending on your requirements. Now at the item level is quite interesting because different items. So for example, a data warehouse and a lake house actually have different ways of configuring their access right in Microsoft Fabric currently. So there are a few nuances between the different items that you need to understand if you're going to be implementing your strategy in your organization. So we'll go through those in the first video. Next, we're going to be looking at data access and these follow a bit of a chronological order that you might notice kind of mimicking how you would approach this in your organization. So for data access, what we mean really is how are we getting access to data, okay? So generally data isn't generated in Fabric. We have to bring it in somehow so that we can do stuff with it. And there's three main ways that we can do that. There's ingestion, so data ingestion is where we copy data from outside of Fabric and we bring it in. That could be either through one of the connectors or via an API, some other method. They're probably the only two. Database mirroring is a fairly new feature in Fabric that basically allows us to mirror the contents of an Azure SQL database or a Cosmos DB 
database and it basically creates a replica in your fabric environment and it manages all of the creates updates and deletes kind of in near real time so that's another option that we need to be aware of at least and think about different strategies for that then we'll look at shortcuts as well because shortcuts are a very important part in fabric and that's where we're not actually physically bringing data in to fabric we're just creating a reference or an external shortcut to data for example that lives in Azure Data Lake Storage, and also in Amazon S3 as well. And then there's some kind of edge cases and think maybe not edge cases, but other things to consider, like is the data in AWS? Is it on-premise? Do I need to create a gateway? All these things are important to understand when you're planning out this migration. So the third video in the series, or the fourth video, if you include this one, then we're going to look at data ingestion, right? So if you've chosen to ingest some data here, well, actually there's three main ways that we can choose of how to do that. Either you can use a data pipeline or a data flow or a fabric notebook. And from what I've been seeing, a lot of people sometimes get these confused and they don't fully understand the capabilities of each of these tools and when to use which one. So, and it might be a combination of all three in some instances, but each of these have positives and negatives and you know, things you can do and things you can't do. So we'll be looking at what those are and when to choose which one. Now, the next one in our list is a very important one, which is around, okay, so we've ingested some data, but where do we actually store this data? What are the different architectural patterns that we can apply? And specifically, which of the kind of data stores in Fabric should we use based on the requirements that we have as a business? As I've mentioned previously, there is the lake house, the data warehouse, and the KQL database. And each of these, again, have different personalities, different things you can do with them, different things you can't do with them, right? So we're going to look at what those things are and then help you decide which one is best for your specific use case in your organization. Here, we'll also look at kind of data architectures in general. So this is where we'll bring in the medallion architecture concept and have a look at that, how to apply it in Fabric. And then we'll move on to my favorite topic, which is data quality. So once we've got our architecture and we've chosen our different data stores that we might need for our architecture, and we've kind of ingested some data into these data stores, then we're going to look at how do we ensure data quality, right? Because I've said previously that one of the main benefits, at least for me anyway, of Fabric is that we have the opportunity to build robust analytics systems where users can finally trust the data that's being presented to them. And you can sleep a lot better at night because you know that each stage in your processing pipeline has been validated. So I'm going to be talking you through how we can apply end-to-end -end data validation right across the data architecture and the data processing pipelines that you create in Fabric. So we'll be looking at what you should be validating, when you should be validating it, why you should be validating it, and how you should be validating it right? for each of those different, what I would call like validation checkpoints along the data processing journey. So that is going to be a very good one. And then we're going to be looking at, okay, so all of our data is in Fabric, how do I connect to that data in Fabric via Power BI? And here you might have heard of Direct Lake. There's a few new options available to you over and above the what you might be familiar with, with import mode and direct query. Now we have a few different options that can help you get data into your Power BI report so that you can do your data modeling in there and kind of build your reports on top of data in Fabric. So we'll be going through what that looks like in that video. Then to finish things off, I'm going to be doing kind of like an end to end migration project, right? So we're going to be looking at each of these and we're going to be using real world data and we're going to be setting up some workspaces, choosing a strategy for data access, choosing data ingestion. And I'm going to be talking you through my thought process all the way through so that you understand why I think a certain architecture or a certain inge ingestion pattern might be best for this data set or for this problem. So that's going to be the end to end migration project done here. And that might be quite a long video, but I think it'd be a lot of value in there just to see how all these things connect together. So that's what I've got in store for this series. I hope you like the sound of that. Hopefully we can tick off some of these really big decision points that people are asking me about. And I'm sure there's hundreds of thousands of people out there with similar question marks around these things. So 
I want to spend a bit of time just talking about each of these in detail. So if that sounds interesting to you, make sure you're subscribed and make sure you click on the next video, which will be workspaces and access control. I'll see you there.